representative of natural and cultural history of Darwin Lecture Series. Tonight we have our third and final lecture in this exciting series. And it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nelson Tate, who is a professor of anthropology here at the University of Oregon, though he comes to us via the University of Iowa and New York University where he received his PhD. And Dr. Ting is both an anthropologist and an evolutionary biologist. He's one of the co-heads of our new molecular anthropology group at the University of Oregon, which is bringing a really exciting genetic dimension to our full rounded anthropological understanding of people and primates and everything else. And he's really using genetics in his research to address questions related to primate evolution, behavior, and ecology, one of the current foci of Dr. Ting's research and something that he's been publishing on widely in a huge variety of journals is to understand how evolutionary processes have shaped patterns of modern primate biological diversity. And this research includes investigating the effects of environmental change, both natural and man-made, on primate communities around the world and particularly in East Africa. Um, so tonight, Dr. Ting is going to discuss this research on endangered African monkeys and how it can help us guide future conservation efforts. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ting. All right, thank you for that introduction, Daphne. Um, so uh, this pretty much summarizes what, what Daphne just mentioned. Uh, I'm a biological anthropologist, and um, my, real, my interest is in uh, primate molecular ecology. So what that means is uh, I use uh, molecular methods, specifically genetics, to address questions uh, that pertain to uh, the ecology and evolution of our closest relatives and uh, the non-human primates. So, uh, and what I, what I really like to focus on is uh, primates in, um, in their natural environments, so natural populations. Um, like Daphne said, I've worked a lot in the tropics of Africa. And I'm, trying, I'm really trying to understand uh, uh, this question here, uh, how does environmental change affect wild animal populations and wild primate populations? Uh, and then more broadly, how can you use that information to designate uh, conservation priorities uh, for these animals? So a lot of the species I work on are very endangered, including a couple of the ones that I will talk about today. So to just give you a brief outline of what I'll discuss today. Um, so. Uh, why should we be doing conservation? What exactly is happening to these animals, uh, primates in particular? Uh, what are the specific threats that primates uh, face and why? Uh, then why should we be incorporating evolution? So this, is, uh, this talk centrally is about what evolution can tell us about these primates and about how best to protect them, uh, going on with our Darwin Day theme. And after that, I want to go into two specific ca case examples that I've worked, with, worked on uh, with my collaborators on these two very endangered uh, primates, the red colobus monkey and uh, the drill monkey, both of which inhabit the tropics of Africa. So uh, let's start here, uh, why conserve and primate threats. So uh, in the very short period of time, at least in terms of geological time, that humans have been on Earth, uh, we've left an extensive footprint uh, on the environment. So this can be measured in numerous ways, uh, whether you're talking about pollution or carbon emissions or climate change or habitat destruction. Uh, there's an undeniable footprint that we have left and uh, we're starting to get a better and better understanding of the consequences uh, of this footprint. So uh, as an anthropologist, I'm interested in this aspect of human behavior. Uh, you know, what actions lead us to, uh, or what drives us to, to these actions of leaving this, leaving this footprint, what socioeconomic factors are, are involved, what cultural factors are involved, and so forth. Uh, but like I said, I'm a biological anthropologist, and, um, and I'm also interested in uh, how, these, how this footprint is affecting our closest relatives, uh, the non-human primates. So uh, you can see from the slide, uh, this is a very diverse group of animals. You have uh, you know, various things like uh, lemurs, uh, from Madagascar, Tarsiers from Southeast Asia, Lorises uh, from Asia, uh, uh, the monkeys from the New World and the Old World, uh, from Central South America and Africa and Asia, uh, and then you have our very closest relatives, uh, the great apes, uh, orangutans, gorillas, and chimpanzees. Um, and these animals find their greatest abundance in the tropical rainforests of the world, so that is the kind of fundamental ecological niche that, uh, that non-human primates occupy. And so the extinction threats to primates really have to do with the actions 
uh, of humans in these areas. Um, so what do these actions involve? Uh, one is human habitat disturbance. So this comes in a variety of forms, uh, mostly habitat alteration in some way. So whether it is clearing forest in some, uh, some way for agriculture or for harvesting fuel wood uh, or for some kind of logging. Uh, this, this, uh, face, this is the longest, or this is the biggest long-term threat that non-human primates face. So, like I said, they occupy these tropical rainforests. If you chop down uh, where they live, or if you uh, destroy these habitats, then uh, they have nowhere to go, and then they'll start facing um, uh, extinction and population declines. So, just to kind of demonstrate the severity uh, that that this is um, uh, that the state is in. Uh, in terms of human habitat disturbance or habitat alteration. These are images of uh, the islands of Sumatra and Borneo in Southeast Asia. And some of these are projected out uh, into the future, but this is loss of forest coverage in these, on these islands. Uh, and these are areas where orangutans, one of uh, our closest relatives, are endemic to, so they only are found on these islands in the wild. So uh, they're both uh, very endangered. Uh, the Sumatran orangutan only exists now in this top corner of Sumatra. Uh, likely will go extinct, uh, at least in the wild, in our lifetime. And the Bornean orangutan is also uh, uh, critically endangered. Uh, and it is because this major habitat loss, largely due to palm oil plantations. So palm oil, if you don't know, is, is found in a wide variety of common products that you might, might find in grocery stores here. And, um, and its use is, being, uh, is driving the, uh, the development of these palm oil plantations, uh, which are being planted uh, in in replacement of forest, which is why these animals are losing, um, losing so much habitat. Um, so, like I said, uh, habitat loss is the biggest long-term threat to non-human primates, but uh, there are some threats that are even greater in the short term. Uh, one of them in certain parts of the world is human hunting. So sorry for these, some of these images are gruesome, but this is the kind of reality of what, of what some of these animals are facing. But uh, this is been commonly referred to as the bushmeat crisis. So uh, bushmeat is wild meat that comes out of the forest. And uh, wild animals, uh, primates included, uh, are being hunted to extinction for their skins, uh, for their body parts, for medicinal purposes, and as a protein resource. Um, so uh, this sounds kind of gruesome or odd that people are eating, uh, eating chimpanzees or gorillas, but uh, this is just a, a cultural difference. Um, uh, it's really no different than us Re exploiting a local resource of meat. So they're just uh, exploiting a local resource of protein. That's what they have available to them. Uh, and this is, um, uh, this is where they get their protein resource. So um, this hunting, uh, while it may have started off at some point uh, in some kind of uh, low intensity, sustainable manner uh, for subsistence means, it's not for subsistence anymore in, in most of these areas. Uh, this is done on a commercial, commercial level. So people are using machine guns, uh, to, to hunt down large groups of primates. Um, and the uh, bushmeat trade has become an international business. So it's not just local villages trading, uh, trading these protein resources. This is, tra this is crossing international boundaries. You have stories of uh, bushmeat coming into the States, uh, into JFK, for example, the airport, um, and being confiscated. So there are a lot of immigrant communities here in the US who find this, these foods as a sort of comfort food. Um, so there's, there's a large demand for this internationally in even Western countries. Um, and to kind of exasperate this issue, logging uh, uh, makes the commercial trade in wild meat even worse. So when you have um, these logging companies who are giving concessions to these forests that are relatively intact, they kind of um, uh, pave roads or cut roads into these forests to kind of penetrate deep into the forest uh, so the trucks can get there and they can uh, cut down um, their timber. And this actually allows hunters to get deeper access into areas that they uh, haven't been able to get to before. So uh, they're able to use logging trucks to kind of get into, uh, hitch rides in deeper into the forest. They can sell the meat to the people who are, uh, to the actual loggers who uh, are cutting down the forest. So, uh, so this, this kind of becomes a compounded issue uh, with hunting and logging happening at the same time and, and um, uh, making these issues worse. Uh, hunting also leads to the pet trade. So when you see uh, uh, orphaned primates, it's typically because um, the mother was uh, killed 
uh, through hunting, and then the infants are usually sold off into the pet trade. So you find this uh, very commonly uh, um, in various parts of the world when you see um, primates in captivity, whether it's in villages or in cities, uh, it's usually because uh, that pet was sold off because, um, because its mother was killed uh, in, in, this, in this bushmeat trade. So primates are particularly vulnerable to these types of things, habitat disturbance, hunting. Uh, they have very long lifespans, so uh, it takes a long time for their populations to recover. Uh, a lot of primates are very sensitive to habitat disturbance, so uh, for whatever reason, uh, they, they focus on certain, um, uh, certain foods in the forest. Um, so if, if you take those foods away, uh, they don't have anything to eat. Uh, so uh, primates in particular of you know, all these different animals that might be facing these types of pressures are, are particularly vulnerable um, to, these, to these threats. So the effort to kind of try and protect primates uh, really, and, and prevent them from going extinct, really falls onto the shoulders of the field of conservation biology. And conservation biology in the modern sense is really a multidisciplinary area, as, as you can see from this slide. So it wasn't always like this, but, um, but nowadays it really combines uh, various theoretical and applied aspects from different fields, from the natural sciences, from the social sciences, and this is just a sampling of, of, of the fields that conservation biology draws from. So although it is a, a you know, biological discipline, it's, it's conservation biology, it really is much more than that and involves you know, all these different other fields uh, to, to, be, um, uh, to be effective. Um, and like I said, this is just a sampling of, of the different fields. Uh, also education is important, business is important, history is important. Um, and then when you bring all these, these different things together, the natural sciences, the social sciences, and even uh, parts of the humanities, um, then you can start doing things like species management, uh, how best to design a reserve, uh, what are the socioeconomics that are driving some of these behaviors, um, uh, what, are, uh, what are some strategies that are best, uh, that will best kind of alleviate those socioeconomic pressures. Um, you can get into environmental law, social justice, uh, ethics, uh, conservation education. So, so this is really kind of a very dynamic multidisciplinary field that draws upon, um, that draws upon uh, a, diverse, a diverse variety of, of disciplines. So like I said, it wasn't always like this. Uh, prior to the 50s and 60s, uh, conservation biology was mostly involved with game management. Uh, people were uh, interested in preserving wildlife, uh, not for the sake of preserving wildlife, but, um, uh, but, to, but to create reserves where people could um, continue hunting animals. Uh, but this kind of discipline in, the, in how it's become something multidisciplinary has really started since the 80s. Um, and it, it started really as a response to what people called the biodiversity crisis. Um, so there were uh, scientists, uh, evolutionary ecologists, who were, um, who were really focused on uh, studying their animals, but they started to realize that these animals are starting to disappear. And then uh, they really started to shift towards, uh, they started to realize that there was this biodiversity crisis and started to shift to ideas for how to preserve these. So a lot of the conservation biologists, the senior conservation biologists you see these days, were at the very beginning um, studying these animals in the field as evolutionary ecologists. So, um, in a sense, conservation biology was born out of evolutionary ecology and is very much applied evolutionary ecology, which brings us back to this idea that uh, why you need to use evolution to understand conservation biology and, and design these strategies, because um, uh, evolutionary ecology is really at the heart of this discipline, or it's at its roots. So, um, so why incorporate evolution? I just talked a little bit about that. But, uh, to get to, so we have a pretty good idea of how evolution works these days. Um, you know, we're getting a better, better understanding as we go along. But um, but this has a lot to do with some uh, very important discoveries. Um, the structure of DNA, uh, which was uh, done by France, Francis Crick and James Watson, uh, this tells us the basis for biological variation. So how genes encode for um, uh, help encode for uh, uh, phenotypic or or physical variation. Uh, the principles of heredity were discovered by Gregor Mendel, Mendel so how, uh, how traits are passed on from one generation to the next. And then of course we get to Charles Darwin, uh, who, you know, this figure shows, uh, you know, this very good example of, uh, of an adaptive radiation, but these Galapagos finches that he found uh, during his travels on the HMS Beagle but he, you know, he looked at 
uh, these finches uh, on the Galapagos Islands and saw that they all had these different beak shapes and that uh, they all descended likely from a mainland, um, mainland finch and kind of radiated and, and, uh, and evolved these different uh, beak shapes based on what they were feeding on. So this is, uh, w was one of these lines of evidence he used to come up with this idea of natural selection. Uh, so, th so that was kind of Darwin's contribution to evolutionary theory. He came up with this mechanism for how evolution works um, and then uh, how you know, this idea of natural selection that um, differential reproduction, uh, certain individuals that have favored variants, uh, have favored variation based on the environment, uh, pass on more in individual, pass on more offspring to the next generation, and, uh, and uh, so those variants become more um, common in the next generation, so differential reproductive success. So this all kind of makes sense to us now, but uh, it's interesting to see the dates of when these discoveries were made. So uh, the way I kind of went through them is actually the reverse order in how they were discovered. So, so Darwin actually uh, had no idea of the mechanism for how traits are uh, encoded in genes and how they're inherited from one generation to the next. So this kind of really speaks to this black box that Darwin was working into, uh, working with and working in, and it makes kind of his discovery of the, this mechanism of evolution um, all the more impressive. Um, so uh, since, uh, since Darwin's discovery of, of uh, or his uh, explanation of natural selection as the mechanism for evolution, uh, we have a much better understanding of how evolution works. Um, and we now know that it's not just natural selection that can change uh, the distribution of variation from, from one generation to the next. Uh, there are other evolutionary forces involved, and uh, like mutation, genetic drift, and gene flow. So mutation being um, a new variation uh, occurring because of a change in DNA. Uh, genetic drift being uh, changes in this, these distributions of variation from one generation to the next. Uh, due to small population size, and gene flow being uh, these changes also being due to variation coming in from other populations um, through migration and mating. So uh, this was kind of uh, framed during the, uh, what is known as the Neo-Darwinian uh, synthesis or the modern synthesis uh, in the 1930s and 40s. So there are many different uh, uh, figures that were involved in this synthesis. Uh, 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 Theodosius, uh, Dobzhansky is one of them, Sewell Wright, Ronald Fisher, um, Ernst Meyer, Julian Huxley. So these people really combined uh, evolutionary theory with population genetics to come up with this idea uh, of how evolution works, what evolution is, and how evolution works um, as we know it today. Um, so why is this uh, important in, uh, in understanding how to manage species in terms of conservation biology? Uh, so just Oh, so uh, the, the Dobzhansky came up with this quote, nothing in biology makes sense uh, except in the light of evolution. And, uh, and you know, conservation biology is included in that. So just as, a, as an example, uh, this is, was uh, demonstrated very eloquently in an experiment with, white -footed, with the white-footed mouse. Uh, and people were interested in, uh, in survivorship in, in populations with low, um, low genetic diversity versus high genetic diversity. So uh, they had these inbred strains and outbred strains of mice that they, uh, that they created in the laboratory. So ones had, the inbred strains had very low genetic diversity and the outbred ones had very high genetic diversity. And in the lab environment where the environment uh, was stable, um, their survivorship was the same. So these, uh, these two different types of mice uh, did the same. Um, uh, they, they both did very well. But they were released in the, into the wild and then when they were in the wild, there was a severe environmental change. It was a very harsh winter. And then following the winter, uh, they went out and captured these mice and found out that the uh, individuals with very high diversity did much better than the individuals with very low, uh, with, with the very low amounts of diversity. So uh, this speaks to, uh, to the idea that, um, you know, again, the, the, the idea behind fitness and natural selection, that variation is very important. And the individuals with very, or the, um, uh, the individuals with a high, high level of variation uh, had an increased chance of surviving because they had more adaptive potentials. They had more variation on which natural selection could, uh, could act. And, uh, and the individuals with low, low amount of diversity, there was less of a chance for, um, uh, for there to be uh, variants or variation that was beneficial and uh, more individuals died out. 
So, uh, so it's a very kind of uh, very simple example of, of why it's important to understand evolution and, gen and variation and genetic diversity in order to understand what is driving uh, populations to, uh, to low population numbers or even extinction. So, um, so it's important to understand these evolutionary processes. All biological diversity we see, all biological diversity we see today is the result of evolutionary processes that have been occurring for hundreds of millions of years. Uh, answers to conservation problems must be developed in an evolutionary framework because of this. So understanding the process of evolution provides us with the best chance of predicting what will happen to a population. And, uh, and understanding the patterns that have arisen from past processes can aid, help us aid in designating conservation priorities. So um, I want to talk a, a bit about that in these case examples. So what does that mean? Uh, so designating conservation priorities in red colobus monkeys and then also um, using evolution to kind of uh, help design conservation priorities or conservation uh, strategies for this endangered monkey, the drill. So let's first talk about the red colobus monkeys and uh, designating conservation priorities for them. So what does that mean? Um, why do we have to designate conservation priorities? Well, if we had no living species that were threatened, or if we had unlimited funds, this wouldn't be an issue. Uh, we wouldn't have to prioritize any conservation efforts. But um, this is not the case. Uh, you know, we're going through this biodiversity crisis, uh, and conservation biology in general is a very poorly funded uh, discipline. Um, there's not a whole lot of money available and funds available to, uh, to develop these strategies and implement these strategies that will help uh, these animals. So what we have to do is we have to make really hard decisions of what is most important to protect. Um, so this is kind of the very first step uh, in conservation biology. Before you start implementing any kind of strategies, uh, you really have to know uh, at the very start what, uh, what you want to protect. Um, and one of the starting points here is the IUCN red list. Um, so if you know about the red list, uh, this is, uh, you can find this online, but this is a list of all the plants and the animals in the world. And you have uh, specialists that go through and classify these uh, plants and animals into different categories. So these categories that you've probably heard of, least concerned, near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, extinct in the wild, or extinct. These are uh, categories that, um, uh, that plants and animals are placed into through some objective criteria. Um, by scientists that will, that gives us an idea of what is most important to protect. Um, something else that IUCN does is uh, create action plans. So for various groups of organisms, they'll go through and systematically um, go through all of them, look at their different threats, and then prioritize what are the animals that are most important to protect and what are the strategies that uh, can be done to help protect them, and what further research needs to be done on these animals in order to, uh, to help their survival. So this is the last action plan that was done on African primates. Uh, and on the cover is not uh, what you might expect. Not, it's not a chimpanzee, it's not a gorilla, but uh, it's this uh, monkey called the red colobus monkey. And uh, red colobus monkeys, uh, as deemed by this action plan, uh, this last action plan, are considered one of the most, if not the most, endangered groups of primates in Africa. Um, so here are some of these, uh, so here are images of some of these uh, monkeys. You can see they come in various different uh, colors. Um, so there's a quite a bit of uh, a level, there's quite a bit amount of variation that you see in these animals. Uh, but they really suffer from all these threats that I discussed. Uh, so habitat destruction, uh, hunting, uh, many populations are particularly sensitive to habitat disturbance. And they have really poor anti-predator strategies. So they get uh, hunted not only by humans, but also by chimpanzees, actually. Uh, and they only exist in the wild, uh, so there are no captive populations. For some reason, we haven't been able to figure out a way to, uh, to maintain them in captivity. We don't know if it's something specific about their diet or what, uh, but they only exist in the wild. And like I said, uh, in the wild, they're not doing so great. So here is a map showing all the different types of red colobus monkeys that are out there. They're, they're around 18 different forms, and they're distributed in this fragmented manner across Africa. And all these different forms look a little bit different from one another, so whether you want to call them species or subspecies uh, um, is kinda, uh, can be kind of arbitrary, but uh, there are 18 different forms. And uh, just to give you an idea of how threatened they are, uh, one and two are endangered, three is probably extinct, 
Four, five, and six are critically endangered. Seven has not been seen in decades, probably extinct. Uh, in Central Africa, we don't really have a good idea of what's going on with these different forms because it's so difficult to work there because of a lot of civil unrest. Um, but we do know there's a heavy amount of hunting in that area. Um, but we don't, have, uh, we don't have very good data on how the animals are doing. Uh, 15 is endangered, 16 is critically endangered, uh, and 17 and 18 are both endangered. So like I said, these, uh, these are not doing so great. Uh, but when we're trying to kind of figure out, you know, okay, so all, none of them are doing uh, very good, but when we're trying to figure out which ones are most important to conserve, it's very difficult um, because we don't have a good idea of how related they are to one another uh, or how they're related to one another at all, and uh, we don't know which ones are most evolutionary diverg evolutionarily divergent. So a part of the conservation biology is trying to preserve, or trying to conserve or protect or pre prevent uh, um, evolutionary history from going extinct. You want to kind of uh, make sure that you protect divergent lineages. That way you don't, you prevent a loss in evolutionary history. So, uh, so it's hard to do this if you don't know uh, how all these things are related to one another and, and how divergent they are from one another. So uh, that's what um, my colleagues and I set out to do, and we wanted to do this using genetics. So the first thing you need to do, though, uh, before getting in the lab and looking at the genetics is you have to, uh, sorry, this is a little bit faint, but, um, but you have to go through and sample all these different, uh, uh, different animals uh, and populations. So this is the sampling regime that we developed. Now, um, this is pretty extensive and all across Africa. So um, I went to actually some of these localities to collect uh, samples. Um, I couldn't go to all of them. That would have been a, a bit much. So I also had collaborators sending me samples. And from some of these areas, especially from Central Africa, uh, that you really, uh, they're really difficult to work in now because of, of um, civil unrest, uh, we used museum specimens um, to get DNA. So, um, so these are the actual localities that I traveled to, to, to get samples. And uh, a lot of people ask, well, what does that mean when you get samples? Um, and what this basically means is I'm going around and following these animals and collecting uh, collecting their poop. So uh, this may sound a bit odd, uh, but you can actually get DNA out of feces. Um, as uh, poop makes its way through your, uh, through your intestine, it's, it takes off layers of, um, of, of, of cells, uh, epithelial cells in your, uh, in your intestinal lining. And, uh, and you can get DNA out of these uh, um, when you uh, collect these samples. So here's some pictures of me collecting some nice, fresh, hot, steamy samples. Um, and this is really the only access we have to a lot of these different species because uh, if they're endangered, if they're hunted, uh, it's really controversial to kind of go in and collect samples non-invasively, like dart them and collect blood. Uh, you really have to do things non-invasively and uh, getting scat, um, uh, getting fecal samples is really uh, the kind of standardized best way to do it uh, that is of least disturbance to these animals. Um, so like I said, uh, uh, fecal samples, um, and also other samples, things like uh, museum specimens, whether it was uh, uh, drilling into uh, tooth roots to get bone, or maybe uh, collecting kind of skin biopsies from, uh, from museum skins, uh, anything really I could squeeze DNA out of, uh, uh, we were all trying to, uh, to use. And so from this, uh, we used a about 1,000 base pair marker of mitochondrial DNA. Uh, and uh, inferred a phylogenetic tree, and this is kind of what it looks like uh, when you kind of plot these different populations um, on a tree. And you can see, uh, you know, there's some divergent uh, phylo groups. That's kind of what I've turned, I've, I've called them. And there's seven different phylo groups here. Uh, they diverged, uh, the point around here is about three million years ago. So that's a much deeper divergence than we had previously thought. Um, so that shows that uh, this is a very kind of um, this is not a shallow radiation, it's much more of a deep radiation with a lot of uh, distinct lineages. Uh, and then these phylo groups all diverged uh, around one and a half million years ago, at least. Um, and when you plot these on a map, uh, this is the, the picture that you get. Um, and what's interesting here is uh, you get some very divergent lineages that are very much, um, uh, very much uh, restricted in distribution and very, very endangered, uh, and, uh, and they're very distinct genetically and, and evolutionarily. 
So if you lose those lineages, things like uh, G or C over here in particular, uh, that, are, that, are, uh, that are critically endangered, you can see the very small distributions, um, you lose a large part of evolution history of this group. So uh, prior to this work being done, a lot of focus was uh, put on uh, these different uh, groups here and, and in East Africa. And uh, people were kind of prioritizing funds going to these groups, but, oops, sorry. Um, but if, if, if people continue to do that, then they would really uh, do that at the expense of these other groups here, uh, which, like I said, which um, would have been bad. Uh, you would have lost a large part of biodiversity in this group. And this thing here, uh, actually, uh, I was not able to sample. My colleagues and I, we were not able to sample this. Um, this is one of the forms that hasn't been seen in a, in a few decades. It's probably extinct. It uh, exists in the largest swamp in Africa, so no one really wants to go look for it. Um, if you want to go look for it, come talk to me afterwards. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure it would be really useful for someone to go do that. But, uh, and also in mu museums, there are only maybe 10 or 15 specimens that are scattered across different museums uh, in the world. So uh, we really don't know much about that animal. And interestingly here, B had a very distinct mitochondrial lineage. This is Miss Waldron's red colobus. Uh, this is um, the only primate to have de been declared to go extinct uh, in the past 100 years. And prior to, prior to the, that being declared, uh, we didn't really know how it was a distinct genetic lineage, uh, but it looks like possibly uh, it, it very well could have been based on, uh, based on these results. Um, so the other example I wanted to talk about was uh, this animal called the drill. And uh, so just going back to this uh, IUCN ac action plan again, uh, the last one that was done, uh, the drill was considered, uh, along with the red colobus, uh, um, you know, one, one of the, among the most endangered primates in Africa. So it was one of the highest uh, uh, conservation priorities um, that the IUCN, th IUCN thought um, scientists should be paying attention to and conservation biologists should be paying attention to uh, in Africa um, for primates. So uh, this is the drill. Um, and it's a rainforest adapted uh, primate, so it, it, it exists deep in the rainforest in West Central Africa. Um, and we know very little about this animal. It's extremely cryptic. Uh, it supposedly uh, congregates in very, very large groups. Um, but it, it's, it's highly threatened, uh, it suffers majorly from habitat destruction, uh, it's classified as endangered, um, and it is also suffers heavily from hunting. So it exists in an area where uh, there is very, very heavy hunting pressure and high population de human population density. Um, so we're interested in looking at the evolutionary history of this animal and addressing this question: How has climate change affected population size in the drill and in po primate populations in uh, primate and in primate communities in, in general? But specifically looking at the drill to, to get a better understanding of this. And so uh, this is the general area of where the drill exists. Uh, these, er this, uh, these forests in West Central Africa called the Cross Sanaga. Bioko forests. So um, to, to get an idea of, uh, of this, you can use genetics. And the idea behind looking at how past climate change has affected the drill uh, is, is to get an idea of how maybe future climate change might affect, um, affect these animals as well. So uh, there's been a lot of attention paid to climate change these days. You've, you've heard a lot about it. Uh, you've heard it in legislature. You've seen it in commercials. Uh, you've heard about animals that are very threatened by climate change. See this polar bear here. Uh, and actually, I didn't know this, uh, but today is uh, National Polar, polar Bear Day, or maybe it's International Polar Bear Day, so happy International Pol Polar Bear Day. Um, so uh, there's a lot of focus on climate change these days. And uh, this paper came out a couple years ago, uh, and it modeled the areas where climate change might be most severe in the next 70 years or so. And in the red is, uh, is where you're, we're expected to see major changes in, in, uh, in temperature. And you can see, uh, actually, it's these, uh, these tropical areas in both uh, terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems that are expected to see a large degree of, uh, of changes in climate. And this is disturbing because we don't really know, uh, there's a lot of work been done on how climate change might affect more animals and plants that live in more northerly or southerly latitudes, uh, like, like polar bears. Uh, but not a whole lot of work that's been done in the tropics on how this climate change might affect tropical animals. Um, and as, as you know, as I mentioned earlier, this is where primates exist. Uh, this is where they find the greatest diversity. So it'd be really good I, uh, to get a, a handle on, on this. Um, so uh, this is this part of West Central Africa here uh, that's blown up. And these are these cross Sanaga Bioko forests. So here's the, uh, this refers to the Cross River in Nigeria over here. 
the Sanaga River over here, and the Pioco Island, which is over here. Um, so this is where the drill is distributed, just in this very limited area, so it has a very limited distribution. Uh, you can see in the green that, is, uh, that is, uh, its, its habitat is heavily fragmented, um, and uh, it has kind of a patchy distribution through these forests. Um, interestingly, in the middle of the distrib distribution is this lake called Barambi Ambo. And uh, from Barambi Ambo, we have a very good pollen, fossil pollen profile, and we have a good idea of how the forest has changed over the years, uh, starting in uh, the late Pleistocene, around 25,000 years ago. And you can see here these pollens, you have a uh, dramatic decimation of the forest between 20 and 10,000 years ago, and then the forest kind of regrows here um, from 10 to about uh, 4,000 years ago. It's actually larger than it is today. And then you have a, a dramatic decrease in forest coverage again over here. Uh, and this is due to changes in climate. Uh, this is the last glacial maximum right here, um, where uh, you have glacial advance uh, and, and you have forest retraction uh, as well um, uh, as you have a, a drier climate. Uh, and then over here is an interesting uh, a time period, and this is what I really want you to focus on. Uh, this is where you have uh, a relatively warm period. Uh, it's not that it's a, it's a cold period or anything, um, and this is an interglacial period, so the glacials aren't advancing, but you have an air, um, and a, a, uh, a ridification of, uh, of, of these rainforest uh, ecosystems in Africa. Um, uh, for whatever reason, uh, you have a drying out of the, of, of the area and you have a, a decrease in forest coverage. Um, so keep that, keep that time period in, in mind. Um, so to do uh, this work, um, you know, did some field work again, so here's some pictures from the field. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll kind of skip over this. But um, uh, there, there are some various different primates. These are pictures from Bioko Island. Uh, that, that are, so these different primates are part of this community. So uh, these are all endangered species here. The drill, uh, the red colobus is the red colobus, Bioko red colobus form, and this is a black colobus. And then uh, these are some different uh, guenins, uh, these uh, arboreal monkeys found in the trees in Bioko. Um, and then you know, this is very critically endangered, and this is an endangered um, uh, uh, species here as well. So, uh, so like I said, we were focusing on the drill. We collected samples from uh, different localities on Bioko Island and throughout the mainland forests. Uh, and uh, again, we used a, a mitochondrial DNA marker, so a female inherited marker. And uh, using this marker, you can kind of infer changes in past population size. And so on the uh, x-axis here, uh, you have time in uh, years before present. And then on the y-axis, you have a log of female effective population size, female because we use a female inherited marker. You can see here uh, you have a dramatic population collapse uh, starting around 5,000 years ago, but really, really uh, declining sharply in this time period, the same time period two to 4,000 years ago where you have that uh, decrease in forest coverage um, uh, and a drying out of that, of, of, of that forest ecosystem in, in Africa. And so what you're seeing is a drastic genetic bottleneck. Uh, so a decrease in population size, uh, which is, um, uh, which is uh, a, a another uh, it can also be described as genetic drift. So, uh, so again, going back to this idea of, of uh, how evolutionary processes have, have acted and, uh, uh, in, these, in these primates in the wild, uh, you're seeing uh, clear evidence of a bottleneck in genetic drift uh, happening around this time period. So, um, uh, so th th these were results published last year uh, by myself and my colleagues. Uh, and then, you know, we're also curious as to see whether this is happening in other animals that share this environment with the drill. Um, so uh, these are results that um, my graduate student, Noah Simons, uh, he's been analyzing using different markers. He's been using a set of microsatellite markers. So these are uh, quickly evolving markers you find in the nuclear genome. Uh, but looking at the Bioko red colobus, um, uh, he collected these data and, and doing the same type of analysis, looking at changes in past population size. Uh, so this graph is very rough. It's not quite as polished as the last one. Um, uh, uh, he just did this analysis last week. But you're seeing the same type of pattern. You're seeing a drastic population uh, crash around that same time period, around two to 4,000 years ago, where you have that um, uh, drying out of the environment and, and a decrease in forest coverage. Uh, so this is particularly concerning because uh, this, this drying out of the forest is what is projected to happen under, under the current conditions of climate change. So right now, uh, the, you have an increasingly uh, warm environment 
uh, happening uh, because of climate change, but then also because humans are cutting down the forests, they're, dis they're disrupting the evapotranspiration cycle um, uh, of these areas so that they're drying out as well. So you're getting, so what you're getting in uh, projecting the future is an increasingly warm and increasingly dry environment. This is the same type of uh, conditions that you saw around this time period, around two to 4,000 years ago. And as you can see, you know, these animals, whether it's a drill or just red colobus monkey, but these tropical forest uh, species, these tropical um, rainforest adapted species are simply not able to cope with these types of conditions. So uh, you could expect uh, further population declines um, as you move forward. Uh, with climate change. And so what this tells us for conservation recommendations uh, for these animals, and especially the drill, is that uh, protection of large tracts of land is very important. Um, that protects them from habitat disturbance and destruction, that if you protect it well, then you prevent um, hunting. And then uh, you get uh, bonus dividends in that you'll also protect the evapotranspiration cycle, so you'll, you'll prevent uh, a drying out of, of these environments. Um, uh, and, and a, loss of, a loss of forest coverage that these animals can't deal with. So uh, in conclusion, uh, primates, including uh, red colobus monkeys, or especially red colobus monkeys and drills, uh, they face these major extinction threats, habitat uh, destruction and hunting, which are both uh, human mediated. And uh, these are also intertwined with other issues in primate conservation, uh, such as the pet trade, uh, conservation biology has its historical roots in evolutionary, in evolutionary biology and evolutionary ecology, uh, so it's a direct outgrowth of these, of these disciplines. And the most effective conservation uh, programs are, go, are those that take conservation, or those that take evolutionary processes uh, and patterns that result from the processes uh, into account. Uh, one way of preserving biodiversity or evolutionary history of a group is to ensure that divergent evolutionary lineages are not lost. So uh, to do this, you have to understand uh, what processes you have led to the, or to understand the evolutionary patterns that you see today. So with the red colobus monkeys, um, uh, really focusing on uh, uh, those evolutionary distinct lineages, uh, particularly ones that are really endangered and have fragmented distributions, and especially in West Africa, which you saw on that map. And for the drill to understand that, uh, that these evolutionary processes that have acted in the past can also act in the future if we're not careful, uh, especially with the projections of how climate change might change these environments. Um, but you know, again, like I said, protecting large tracts of land uh, help with will help with habitat loss, protecting that well will help with hunting. Uh, and then um, uh, you know, protecting it will also uh, preserve that evapotranspiration cycle, which will uh, help with um, maintaining a, a, humid, a humid climate um, and, and uh, prevent a loss, a further loss in forest habitat that these animals can't, uh, can't deal with. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Museum of Natural and Cultural History for inviting me to give this talk. And then here are some, uh, uh, some groups and collaborators and some funders uh, that have uh, helped me with my work. And I'd like to thank you for, uh, for coming here and listening. Any questions? Uh, yeah. I apologize if you explained this already, but how did you determine the population sizes of the drill example from, say, 5,000 years ago? So uh, using genetics, uh, you can, uh, based on how, if you, sample, if you sample the current genetic variation, and you can look at how that genetic variation, how all those alleles coalesce back in time, and based on the shape of that tree, you can infer uh, certain population dynamics that have occurred in the past. So uh, certain trees that, for example, are very uh, shallow and wide, that might be evidence of population expansion. Uh, ones that uh, look very structured uh, are, examples of, um, are examples of population crashes. And uh, if you can uh, get an idea of generation time and mutation rate uh, of, of the marker and generation time of the animal, you can infer when in time in the past that these different changes in population size have happened. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about the implementation. So it makes sense that once we have this framework and potentially funding, mm -hmm. um, and we know what to do, what then are the biggest um, roadblocks to doing that? As you mentioned, some of these areas are in places where there's serious 
yeah. physical unrest and war. So even if we can throw all the money at the science at it, um, who ultimately it's these individual countries who are making decisions. So is there a, a group of policy analysts who try to figure out how to make it happen after the recommendations are made? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's part of conservation biology. Um, you know, when, when I had it up there, you know, policy and law and, um, and yeah, that's really tricky. There's, I don't think there's any kind of universal solution. I think it's just gonna be very specific to, to whatever countries or habitats uh, uh, that are around and the so socioeconomic conditions that are surrounding them. But yeah, I mean, you can designate conservation priorities, but uh, sometimes, um, you know, some actions are just not feasible, like you mentioned with civil unrest. So uh, a good example is the Niger Delta Red Colobus. Um, so that's this, Let's see here. This one over here, uh, G, uh, just discovered in the 1990s uh, and facing extinction already. Um, and you know, based on this work, uh, it's a high conservation priority. Uh, this work actually got it on the top 25 endangered list, uh, top 25 primates in the world, uh, top 25 endangered primates uh, of the world list. Um, but the problem with here is uh, this is an area of civil unrest. So if you know anything about the Niger Delta, uh, it's a large uh, oil producing area and there's a lot of civil conflict there um, between uh, people from that region and, uh, and people coming in and, and, uh, and exploiting the area for oil. So, uh, so realistically, although it is, a, it is a high priority in this sense, uh, it's not realistic to kind of go in there and implement some kind of conservation uh, solution. So, uh, so you know, people have done workshops to, to try, since, since this work has been published, people have tried to you know, form workshops to try to you know, develop solutions about this, but, but uh, conservation ultimately is done on the ground. And if, 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 you can't, if you can't do it, if you can't get on the ground and actually implement any kind of solution, then, then it's, it's just not gonna work. So certainly you know, having priorities and throwing money at, at it is, or generating money for it is a start, but it, th it is so complicated and there's so many other factors that need to be uh, taken into account. And like I said, there's gonna be no universal answer. It's gonna be, I think, very, very different from, from case to case. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's extremely, extremely complicated. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, earlier the, uh, the issue of high diversity, low diversity. And it wasn't really clear to me when you, particularly with this graph, when it says which red colobus forms to protect. Mm -hmm. Uh, do the ones that you're keying in on have high diversity and you're selecting that and letting the others kind of go by the board with, because they have less diversity? Right, I, I, I see what you're saying. Um, so that, that example I brought up with the white-footed white mouse was just an example of one way that, um, that an evolutionary, uh, one evolutionary explanation for why certain animals might do better than others. Uh, that doesn't apply as much to, to this example in terms of diversity. Uh, for this one, I was really just looking at uh, which ones, which lineages are most divergent from one another. And the ones that are most divergent, uh, we felt like were the ones that are most important to protect because if you lose those, then you're losing you know, a whole side of their phylogenetic tree. Um, so th that didn't have to do as much with, uh, with diversity within any of these groups. Does that make, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little more about this process of getting the monkey DNA out of the monkey poop, because presumably there's a lot of other kinds of DNA right. in the monkey poop as well, and if you also get bonus information about diet and such uh -huh. on that as well. Yeah, and this is not something I, I thought too much about in my previous work. Um, uh, so in, in the, the DNA, you know, you extract DNA from these samples, and the DNA that's actually in there is, um, very little of it is actually from the monkey. Most of it is bacterial. Uh, there, it, there probably is some stuff from their diet and people have started to look at that. And then especially here at University of Oregon, there's such a strong uh, uh, microbial ecology group here in, in the bio department that uh, they're actually interested in things like fecal samples, uh, not, for, not for the host DNA, but for the bacterial DNA, which is the vast majority of DNA that's in there. So there's a lot of different things that you can actually study uh, with these um, with these DNA extracts from fecal samples, not just the host genetics, um, but also uh, bacterial genetics. Uh, people have looked at diet to try to extract whether it's plant DNA or other animal DNA to see what these animals were eating. 
so I mean, it, it, is, it is tricky. There's just a lot of information in there and, and parsing it out, especially with all these genomic methods that are coming out now, where you're just kind of sequencing everything in the DNA extract. Uh, it, it, it can be very complicated, but um, that is a very, um, it's a very fruitful area of research and it's, it's a direction that, uh, especially in collaboration with some of the microbial ecologists here, uh, that, that I'd like to investigate with, with these animals um, and you know, how, how other forms of DNA in those fecal samples uh, might differ based on diet or based on um, different habitats, based on more degraded habitats or more pristine habitats and stuff like that. So yeah, there, there's a lot of, it's a very new field to, to look at those aspects and I think um, there's a lot to be done. So it's, it's, it's an exciting time for that. Sort of an eridification of the four, two to 4,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, any relation to human footprint at that point in time? Or what's the, what's the reason? Probably not. That is uh, that's probably something that just happened naturally. I'm not exactly positive what caused that. Um, I'd, I'd have to go back in the literature and look. Uh, but uh, at that point, uh, you probably didn't have uh, severe changes to the environment being caused by humans, obviously Daphne would know whether or not, <laughs> being, being the archeologist, but, uh, uh, but that, that was not human mediated. Um, uh, that was something that was probably more, more natural. I don't know, Daphne, do you have any, do you have any opinions on, on what human alterations in the environment in Africa at that time period? Yeah, about 4,000 years ago, you don't have a lot of agriculture in that area yet. I mean, the data is very difficult because tropical rainforests and archeological preservation don't go very well together, but our, um, Current evidence suggests that you really have agriculture coming into that region, region about 2,000 years afterwards. So I mean, there is still possibility for maybe a strategy that involves burning, but our sense is that the population densities are so low that we wouldn't expect that deforestation to be human caused. But it is still kind of a good question. Any other questions?